I'm Christine Fox, and I'm a senior fellow here at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. And um, we have had already an incredible morning, in my view. We've been told to imagine more. We've been told to emulate cheetahs. We've talked about establishing a climate command and a climate intelligence service. Um, as we just heard from the goals panel, we have, as a nation, the need for some pretty ambitious and critically important goals. And we uh, really need to have those goals, but we also need to achieve them. Achieving them is absolutely in, um, a, an inevitability uh, that we have to achieve today, and this panel is going to talk about the challenges to achieving those goals, specifically the gaps in our knowledge or our capabilities. And time, as we've heard, is not on our side, thus the cheetah. So from a national security perspective, we've heard a lot this morning about the need to, uh, to be prepared to respond to an ne inevitable increase in global crises, humanitarian disasters, actual conflicts over resources such as water rights. Um, there's also a risk that one nation will take it upon themselves to mitigate the uh, specific climate effects through geoengineering techniques, as is the topic of terminal shock that Admiral Stavridis encouraged us to read. Would we even know that that is happening were it to be happening? Fortunately, DOD recognizes these growing risks due to climate change and calls for warfighting concepts and combatant commander engagement plans that will include climate change considerations. So for this panel today, we're really fortunate to have Admiral Sam Lockler with us, the former Indo-PACOM commander, who's going to share his views of climate challenges and gaps in capability in the Indo-Pacific region. We've also talked a little bit already about the challenges to the military from a service perspective. Our military is already experiencing the effects of climate change at their bases as they're struggling with fires and flood. The training environments where extreme weather events are um, increasing the risk. In the future, many parts of the world, the operating environment is gonna be more extreme, harder, but also colder. We've been talking a lot already about the Arctic. Again, the DOD is, uh, is recognizing this and their climate adaptation plan requires all threat assessments to incorporate climate change factors. And uh, we have another great leader with us this morning to help us talk about the issues challenging the services themselves, specifically the Navy and former Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral John Richardson. Okay, so these extreme weather effects are affecting our forces around the world and our forces at home in our military, but it's also affecting all parts of our country, threatening the national security of our citizens here at home every day. The federal support for disaster response is growing and likely to grow more. So we're really fortunate to have Mr. Eric Letvin in here with us today, FEMA's Deputy Assistant Administrator for Mitigation. He's facing these challenges every day, and he's going to talk to us about his perspective on the gaps and challenges as he prepares FEMA for this future. So we need to also talk about technology. This is the Applied Physics Lab. Inevitably, the help of tech, we will need the help of technology to close these gaps. And who better to talk about technology than Mr. Rob McHenry, the deputy director of DARPA? Now, there's no doubt in my mind that Mr. McHenry could talk to us about many interesting and important new technologies. But this morning, instead, we've asked him to address the gaps they face at DARPA as they search for technological solutions to both help prevent and respond to climate change. And then finally, what of DOD's specific contribution to climate change? Well, let's consider for a moment that DOD is the largest institutional user of petroleum and correspondingly, the single lar largest institutional producer of greenhouse gases in the world. Now, anything DOD can do to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions will certainly help. Again, DOD recognizes this and now calls for an accounting of the carbon footprint of all new acquisition decisions. Accounting is important, but real change will only occur when actually emissions are reduced. And Mr. Joe Bryan, DOD's first chief sustainability officer, is leading this effort for the Secretary of Defense. Today, he's going to share his perspectives on the gaps and challenges the Defense Department faces as they seek to operate effectively, but also sustainably. 
So clearly, we have a very strong panel of experts to help us better talk about the gaps we are facing to achieve our goals. Each of our panelists is going to make some opening remarks, and then we're going to have plenty of time for questions. So please start forming your questions now. Um, I promise we'll have some time for questions at the end. But for now, I'm going to start with each of our panelists, and I'd like to turn to you, Admiral Lockler, first to talk about the Indo-PACOM region. Well, thanks, Christine, and thanks, APL, for, for hosting this in such a wonderful facility. <clears throat> I'm a little hoarse, uh, obviously, from the smoke out there, but we'll... Uh, See if I can last five minutes here. Uh, about a decade ago, uh, I was asked by, uh, in a trip I'd made to, to Boston, I'd asked by a Boston Globe reporter what I thought the, large, the greatest uh, security challenge to American interests globally would be looking forward. And my answer was uh, climate change. Of course, um, that created a, a fair amount of uh, <laughs> consternation back in the Capitol on, on both the... Uh, White House side, which was in favor of what I said at that time, uh, and some members of Congress who weren't. So I was immediately called back to Washington to explain myself to, uh, to different factions. And uh, as these senators and congressmen were, were having me in testimony at various times on this issue, uh, I said, look, I said, I'm not a scientist. I said, the scientists are out there. They're telling you what's going on. I said, I'm just me and the thousands of people that work for me in the Indo-Pacific Command are, are just people who observe. And our observation is that in an AOR, an area of responsibility that, that encompasses over 50% of the globe, uh, it is 80 of that 50%, 83% of it is water, 17% of it is land. Of that 17% land, six out of every 10 people alive live in there. And it's projected at the end of this century that seven out of every 10 people of the 10 billion people that will inhabit the earth will live in that part of the world. And in it, of, that, of those people that live there, 80% of them live within 200 miles of the coast because they're seeking employment, they're seeking food sources and that type of thing. Now, on top of that, uh, we have in that AOR, there's 36 nations that the U.S. participates with or not with, depending on what day it is. Uh, five of the seven alliances that the U.S. has are there. Uh, there the five, five of the major nuclear powers in the world are there. And the Indo-Pacific Command Air AOR is the most uh, militarized area in the world. Uh, on the backdrop of that, there's great power competition that we're all aware of. Uh, there are a mix of capabilities among the governments there to deal with the issues of, of, of any issues, in particular of climate change. Uh, there are uh, territorial disputes. There are fishing rights disputes. Uh, there are airspace disputes. I mean, just, just, keep, just keep going. And the, uh, there are a host of transnational threats. There's the largest producer of, of drug precursors in the world there. It's where most human trafficking is, is emanates from. Um, and then, of course, the issue of as they industrialize in that part of the world, just the massive amount of air pollution. I was talking to someone today how bad it is here today. It's, I think it's like 280 parts per million. Uh, the last time I was in Beijing, it was over 500 parts per million. So and you see that kind of being replicated as industrialization of that area. And all this is happening against the backdrop, I think, of the creeping reality of climate change, which uh, runs on a different time schedule than uh, all the other blips and blurps of things that happen in an AOR as complicated as the Asia-Pacific. Now, the Indo-Pacific also is, does not have the same as the European Command has, where my, my friend Jim Savridis was and I were able to serve at one time. There's no real, uh, there's no European Union. There's no NATO connectivity, uh, based primarily on the fact that we established bilateral relationships in the PACOM AOR, and those relationships and the ones that are in the periphery of it are like I always explained one time, is like a patchwork quilt. They're all kind of threaded together, but it's, but it's not very strong in any particular place. So it, it gives, doesn't have the opportunity for us to be able to, to have, um, thoughtful discussions in the Indo-Asia Pacific with our partners, even some of our allies, 
to bring a holistic view to the problem that's emerging in, in, in that area. Um, now, I'll give you a little example um, that I've used a couple times that I was shocked by when I, when I, went, when I was in PACOM. Um, I went to Bangladesh. Now, Bangladesh, for few Americans can even find it on the map if you ask them, right? But today, there's 165 million people living in Bangladesh, uh, over half the population, or about half the population in the United States. The area land-wise of, of uh, Bangladesh is the same as Iowa. So the population density there would be the same as if you took the entire population of the world and put it in the continental United States between the Pacific Ocean and the, I mean, between the Mississippi and the Pacific Ocean. The whole, whole world living there. And the population there are, are you know, at, at a poverty stamp, oh, sorry, at a poverty standard of, of less than uh, $2 a day, and it goes on and on and on. So I guess if I go to the gaps, and I'll cover those in about one minute. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> sorry about that. The gaps are, are tremendous, but I would say at the strategic level of thinking, the gaps, our primary gap is situational awareness. And this ability to continually monitor what's happening in the environment so that it can be overlaid in our planning and our efforts to protect US and our allies' interest. At the operational level, which is where we, most of the combatant commands do the planning for contingencies, for, for war plans, those types of things that inform the future force that we're going to build, I would say our biggest gap is ability to maintain planners that can, planners, the people that can incorporate the situational awareness and then layer the climate situational awareness into the plans against all the other crises and issues that I talked about. At the tactical level, which is where the ships and the airplanes and the soldiers and the airmen and marines operate, the, the primary gap there, I think, is ensuring that they don't get surprised by a capability that they needed that was deficient because of a climate change issue that we didn't, re didn't, didn't realize. So we need to have ships can operate in the Arctic now. We don't build them to do that. We need to do that. We need to consider what the changes in the climate and ocean temperatures and salinity and things are doing to our submarine force and the ability for them to operate. And I'm sure John will get more into that, but those are the, my primary gaps. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. So now I will turn to Admiral Richardson to talk about the perspective from the Navy and the military. Right, and I think uh, concentrating on the Arctic, if uh, you don't mind, because I think that that's a really great uh, case study. And, um, you know, I'm tempted because I am a submariner and a nuke, and therefore I have very low EQ, and I just sort of list, <laughs> you know, start with my list of gaps and run down there. But I thought maybe I'll do my best to set some context, which is uh, that uh, just like climate change, I think that the Arctic as an operational or strategic problem, everybody knows it's there. But given the urgency of some of the problems that are just within our 10 meter, you know, range, it's uh, just uh, often difficult to allocate the resources and the time and everything it takes to really address it. And so this has been, I think, uh, we're, we're coming out of it, I would say, in the, in the uh, climate change uh, arena. Joe can speak to that much better than me, but uh, it's been, you know, as, as Admiral Locklear said, it's been with us for a while, and, and I'm really encouraged to see that efforts like this one at APL, you know, just a top-level, world-class institution, are spending so much time doing this. And uh, you know, if you think about the uh, challenge that faces us, the combination of the Arctic and climate change, you know, it is a, a, a problem that needs to be solved. And I would talk about, I would just discuss the gaps in maybe uh, three areas. One is that we have an experience gap, right? We just haven't been operating up there uh, as frequently as we operate other places. And it's that combination of it's a very difficult place to operate. And as Sam said, you know, many of the ships are not hardened for ice operations. And so we have to be very careful about operating up there. And uh, so there's, there's the difficulty of it. And then again, there's this prioritization. You know, if I'm gonna deploy a ship right now, and we, you, know, you never have more than uh, as all, everything that you need, uh, you know, am I gonna send that to the Seventh Fleet area of responsibility, or am I gonna send that up to the Arctic, right? And, and so those are the types of decisions that, uh, that face us. So when we did, we did send a carrier strike group up to, uh, 
the Arctic region when I was uh, chief of naval operations. And I'll tell you what, that was high adventure. And we had to uh, you know, get out all the old books, right? Because we hadn't been there in a long time. So we're getting out all the procedures from like the 1980s, you know, the, the Cold War when we used to go up there all the time. And uh, we found that, you know, even with climate change, it's very, very cold still. And uh, it, the seas get incredibly rough. And so all of these lessons, you know, in terms of just operational experience, uh, you could see that the, op the operational gap. One, one funny thing was uh, that uh, we're reading through the books and it's like, hey, uh, don't forget to bring your baseball bats. Like, what? Uh, you know, is this code name for some system? It's like, no. You know, we're talking Louisville Sluggers because there's nothing like a baseball bat to go out on deck and bash the ice off your, uh, you know, your radar or superstructure or something like that. So, you know, it's calling up Louisville Slugger and there's these collectible bats out there now with the ship's name on them and all that stuff. So it just gives you a sense of the operational gap that exists there. Uh, and then I would say, uh, and, and this is sort of a tee up for Rob from DARPA, is the technology gap up there, there's just not a lot of infrastructure. And so when you do operate up there, and I've done my fair share of that, uh, most of it under the ice, but um, it, you know, it's difficult to communicate up there, right? The satellite footprints don't really lend themselves to high bandwidth communications. Uh, the satellites are well beyond their service life as much of that uh, const uh, constellation is. And so we're, you know, we're on, a, uh, on a wind and a prayer uh, for uh, just you know, extending that out as long as we can. Um, it's tough to navigate up there. Uh, it's, uh, the, the energy infrastructure is uh, something, you know, a problem begging to be solved. And uh, again, these are really harsh conditions. And so you know, what are those uh, energy sources that are not gonna need uh, replenishment, logistics lines that to, to re-fuel you know, them or something? So, uh, you know, nuclear and some of these other emerging technologies, I think, uh, show great promise. Uh, you know, I was, it just sort of happened to read that, uh, you know, there's, there's a role for unmanned and uh, autonomy and artificial intelligence up there because it is so hard for people to sustain themselves. And so if you can, you know, uh, think of a case study for unmanned technology, that is a great one, right? And uh, again, APL showing that they're just leading out here the application of artificial intelligence to predicting uh, the marginal ice zone and you know, where the, the ice is uh, thick and thin and where it might be navigable. Just read that uh, this morning you know, in terms of a press release uh, just showing how you can apply these technologies to start to fill this technology gap. Mm -hmm. And then finally, and Christine, I, just, I, I include this uh, just for you, uh, is that if you combine experience and technology in our future uh, geostrategic uh, challenge that Admiral Locklear articulated so well, we've really got some policy gaps there that are going to, you know, in terms of how we just face this, right? So there's going to be access to resources that have never been accessible in our, in our memory, right? How do we manage that? There's going to be access to uh, shipping lanes and navigation routes that have never been accessible before. And so how are we going to govern that, right? And then uh, it was mentioned, I think, in the last panel, the uh, importance of things like fishing and uh, you know, these big ocean currents that are thermally driven by their time in the Arctic. You know, how is that going to change with climate change? And uh, you know, those things, you'll feel that impact off the coast of Peru right? Uh, if, uh, when that happens. And the momentum of those things is really hard to turn. And so it seems like you know, this, this area is going to open up. Some of it's going to be inside of territorial seas. Some of it's going to be inside of exclusive economic zones. Some of it's going to be uh, you know, the high seas. But I think all of it needs to be governed, or we're going to end up uh, with one nation making a unilateral move that the rest of uh, the world has to pay for. So I'll stop there. That's Thanks. just great. Thank you so much. So now I'd like to turn to the FEMA perspective. And Mr. Levin, if I could hear from you, please. Sure. Uh, thank you for um, inviting me here today. So I'll talk about a few things briefly. Um, a lot of you are familiar with the American Society of Civil Engineers infrastructure report card. And uh, um, you know it's, it's, it's not great. When there's a, a natural disaster, we meet the community where they are. When, when the communities uh, 
resources are overwhelmed and the state's resources are overwhelmed, we get a federal disaster declaration if it meets the criteria. And then we come in to help uh, with public assistance, individual assistance, uh, hazard mitigation, which is what I do. I run the pre and post disaster uh, mitigation grants uh, for the agency. I like to tell the, the rest of the agency in response to recovery, I actually have the ability to put them out of business. Um, if we had enough funding and dollars, uh, that'll never happen, obviously. Um, so, I, so the point I want to make is that uh, there's a lot of aging infrastructure out there. We replace our infrastructure one to two percent a year, and when there's a natural disaster, uh, you know, the wastewater treatment plants, the electrical grid, um, like you saw in Puerto Rico, uh, all of that becomes part of the uh, recovery process. So in terms of in terms of gaps, I think, first of all, we need to understand where our infrastructure is, where we'd like it to be. Uh, if our infrastructure was uh, more modern, um, if it uh, complied with uh, the hazard resistant provisions in our building code, um, that would certainly help us quite a bit become more resilient and allow recovery to go uh, much more quickly. Um, with regards to building codes, um, i like to remind everybody that about two-thirds of the states do not have a modern building code that includes hazard-resistant provisions, about two-thirds. So a big gap would be, um, uh, I think, for states and local governments to adopt and enforce um, a modern building code, uh, international codes, that have the hazard-resistant provisions in them. And even some of the states that do um, adopt and enforce that code, uh, it's clearly um, a lot of effort. Uh, we saw this after Maria in Puerto Rico. We had uh, about a dozen trained, uh, they, they had actually adopted and enforced a modern building code, but they only had about a dozen building code officials for the entire island. And we had to go in and spend about $70 million to help uh, hire and train um, uh, allow the Commonwealth to, to, hire, to hire building code officials. Why did we do that? Because of the tens of billions of dollars of not just FEMA, but all of the, uh, all, all of the funding that are going into Puerto Rico for rebuilding. So uh, building codes is certainly very important. Um, uh, it, but, but of course, the building codes look backwards. They look at historical what has happened in the past. As we saw just up the road, you know, a few miles from here in Ellicott City, we had two 500-year floods that happened. Uh, people lost their lives just a few miles from here. Um, and so uh, another gap would be uh, the codes look backwards. We need to look forward. We need to understand there's a new national climate assessment coming out this fall. How do we make that data actionable at the state and local level, at the parcel level, so, so that um, uh, smart decisions are being made with regard to, to land use? Um, Right now, we require communities to have an updated hazard mitigation plan every five years. We are requiring that it, they do include future risk and climate change. Um, but if you look at uh, planning and zoning across this country, at the local level, a lot of planning and zoning decisions are made without the knowledge. Um, uh, and some communities are doing a great job of, of incorporating climate change in New York City and Boston and some other cities, but a lot of places aren't. I was in Eastern Kentucky earlier this week looking at some of the flood damage from last year. And I think, you know, with equity, there's a lot of underserved communities that don't have the capacity and capability to um, understand what that risk is and make smart decisions at the local level. So making that climate data actionable and understood at the local level so that smart decisions can be made is also, um, I think, another large gap. Um, and I think I'll end with, uh, in terms of another gap would be uh, insurance. Um, we are still a very underinsured uh, country overall. FEMA is the largest flood insurance provider. We have about 4.8 or so million policies. Um, but uh, it's very common after an event to, um, uh, like in Hurricane Harvey, about half the flood insurance claims came from outside of the 100-year the, the or special flood hazard area. So where it rains, it can flood. Just because there's a line on a map does not mean the water stops there. So we encourage everybody to, uh, to purchase flood insurance. Um, but a lot of areas, like in Kentucky, uh, where we were this week, 
only 10% or so of the structures in the floodplain had flood insurance. And so what is the pathway for that community, for those homeowners, that school district to recover? <coughs> um, the average flood insurance claim for homeowners, you know, roughly $100,000, maybe a little bit more. Um, if you don't have flood insurance, you get turned over to individual assistance in FEMA. That average claim is like seven or $8,000. We, we, we pay for some temporary housing or hotels. So um, uh, that's just flood insurance. And we're seeing what's going on with wildfire in California. A lot of the private sector um, you know, are pulling out. We saw this happen in Florida you know, after the hurricane. So um, making sure that homeowners and communities have the proper level of insurance or catastrophic bond, which is becoming more common, um, is a much greater path for um, being resilient against climate change. We have a long ways to go uh, with building codes, um, aging infrastructure, and also the availability and uptake of insurance. So I'll stop there. Thank you. It's quite, quite a list. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. McHenry, can we ask you to turn, please, to technology and DARPA's perspective on GAPS? Yeah, and so this question of gaps is sort of core to, to DARPA's mission and how we operate. So, you know, DARPA's, you know, the first line of DARPA's mission is to prevent the strategic surprise of the United States. And uh, I don't think it's an overstatement to say that climate change represents one of the most uncertain vectors of strategic surprise that faces our nation. Um, and so, uh, but yet when we look at the DARPA portfolio today, there are some climate motivated program activity that, that we can point to. Um, you know, some of the, the uh, responses to the kind of known, kind of well understood impacts of climate change, such as sea level rise and, and storm intensity increases, uh, motivated the, the refence program that, uh, you know, Ralph highlighted in the beginning, sort of, you know, forming, uh, inducing natural reefs to grow in front of the, you know, 1,700 oceanfront properties that the Department of Defense owns and operates that are exposed to these increased risks. Um, there are programs in the Biological Technologies Office on, understanding potential pathogens coming from thaw thawing permafrost, um, you know, before they impact our military operations or, or broader society. And then we have a, a program called, uh, you know, AI-assisted uh, AI -assisted climate tipping point modeling, uh, not, the, not the roll off your tongue, best roll off your tongue acronym in the, in the DARPA program portfolio. Mm -hmm. uh, but funding some of the work that Ralph also highlighted about trying to understand you know, what are the, the non-linear disruptive changes in the climate coming from things like ocean current disruption or deforestation and trying to understand, you know, what are these sort of uh, low probability, very high impact uh, directions that climate change could take us so that we can understand what those, you know, what strategic risks may emerge from that. Um, but, I'll, but I'll say that that, uh, that portfolio is, is uh, you know, it's relatively anemic. Um, given the, the severity of the, the strategic surprise that I think this, this area represents. And so the, the biggest gap from a DARPA perspective is actually uh, its people. Um, you know, any, anyone who knows how DARPA operates know that nothing happens at DARPA without a, a passionate program manager coming to change the world. Um, and we simply don't have the cadre of program managers in the agency today um, that are focused on this problem set. And it, it's something that we've identified, uh, you know, strategically at DARPA, uh, some, uh, you know, an area that we want to hire into and, and try to mitigate. And so, uh, uh, you know, the main, main reason I'm here today, it's, this is a recruiting trip for me, right? Um, you know, I'm going to give you the most actionable advice that, I, that I've heard so far, which is come work for DARPA. Um, if, if you're passionate about this area, you want access to, uh, you know, extreme risk tolerance, the ability to cross, you know, cross the Department of Defense and the government, access to resources that, are, that you, it's hard to find in other places, um, we want your help. We want you to come tackle these big problems for us. And, and I will highlight that, you know, there's the traditional program manager model. Um, there's also some new opportunities at DARPA, uh, something called a, the, our Innovation Fellowship Program um, that uh, is the first time it allows like postdocs um, to come to DARPA. And, and I highlight that in particular because the, that, that group of innovation fellows manage a process at DARPA that's called the Advanced Research Concepts, um, which are meant to be sort of, sort of uh, surveys across these areas of potential strategic disruption. And we, we, in the construction of that program, one of the, the sort of topics, the exemplar topics that we identified that motivated that was climate change. Um, but yet we haven't released that topic yet because we don't have the right fellow to come draft the topic and manage that process. 
Um, so, so this isn't sort of a, a theoretical desire for, for getting the right people in the agency. It is, uh, um, you know, it's, it's existential to our ability to operate in, the, in this domain. Um, so so that, that is the gap that I would like to highlight, is uh, we, we need your help to come help DARPA be DARPA and, and focus the right program activity uh, to prevent the strategic surprise of the country due to climate change. Thank you. And then, Mr. Bryan, you have the exciting opportunity in the Defense Department to raise the awareness on sustainability. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on your gaps. Yeah, thanks, Christine. Thanks for inviting me. You know, we had, we had the chance to have dinner last night, and, and I'll say... Um, you know, on the panel, you have uh, at least two applied mathematicians and uh, at least two engineers and a couple of engineers at the table, and you have one art history, ma art history major. So the <laughs> one gap we should probably address up front is the IQ gap between everyone else on the panel and me. So um, I hope everyone's grading on a, on a curve on this, uh, on this event. But uh, interestingly, the gap that I, I'd like to highlight is actually um, one about understanding. And I think that um, the gap that we have inside the department that I I see, and in the broader community, not just inside the Department of Defense, but broadly in the national security community and in, 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 in our political discourse, is a gap in understanding of the moment that we're in. So, um, and that moment is with respect to climate change. It's also with respect to the global energy transition that we are accelerating into every day. And, uh, and the implications uh, of that for the Department of Defense and for national security and for uh, U.S. competitiveness, both in our economy and for our, our, our competitiveness and our, uh, and our military capability. And let me, let me um, expand on that a little bit. Um, you know, there's an argument by some, and I think folks in the room have probably heard it, we hear it quite frequently, that there's this uh, somehow an inherent tension between what's good for the climate and what's good for the Department of Defense's primary mission, which is obviously to protect and defend the United States of America. Um, and that those two things are out of alignment and we're in the middle of a zero-sum game, whereas if we advance policies that are good for the climate, somehow we're paying less attention or somehow we're doing less service to our primary mission. And I, I believe and I think the facts bear it out that that, that argument is fundamentally flawed. Um, and that there is, in fact, tremendous alignment between what we can do for the climate and what we need to do for our primary mission at the Department of Defense. And I'll just give you a, a couple of examples. Um, I think uh, uh, Meredith Berger was on the previous panel, I think folks have alluded to here, look, we have a, an installation enterprise that houses critical missions essential to the war fight um, and essential to all the things the Department of Defense does. Uh, those installations are dependent, for example, on the commercial electric grid for power. Um, and what we know is that we face a threat environment in the United States and globally from climate impacts on uh, energy infrastructure, but also from things like cyber effects, and, uh, uh, the cyber threat to energy infrastructure and the commercial grid uh, in particular. And then we also have this, what's grown in the past couple of years is a, an increasing kinetic threat to the grid. I think over the past couple of years we've seen growth in kinetic attacks on the grid, which are, uh, are sort of unprecedented. Um, and so in that threat environment, what do you do? How do you mitigate that threat to the critical missions that we run on our bases? Well, one thing you do is get really efficient you minimize your, your reliance on that asset in the first place. Second thing you do is you can bring distributed generation and storage inside the fence line and put it close to uh, critical missions so that if you lose the grid, um, those missions can stay up and running. And then third, you put in place controls like microgrids and other technologies to make sure you're keeping the lights on. Uh, you're not keeping the lights on the gym, in the gym at expense of, of the mission critical facility that you have on base. Um, and so in that case, all of those things that I just described, if you don't care a whit about the climate, you should still do them because they're what you need to do in order to protect the capability of our facilities. They also happen to be good for the climate. So again, the, the tension uh, that is sometimes argued between mission and climate, I think, is, is a, a, again, a, a false argument. And operationally, I think the same thing holds true. Um, uh, Admiral Richardson and uh, Admiral Locklear can speak more eloquently about it than I, but we have a joint warfighting concept in the Department of Defense. Um, and uh, four functional concepts under that. One of them is, is contested logistics. We believe that we will not be able to deliver uh, what we need, when we need it, where we need it to be, uh, uncontested. So people are going to try and prevent us from getting the things that we need to our operational forces when they need them, uh, should, should we need it to be there. Um, and so if that's a fact and we all accept that, um, 
What does that have to do with the climate? Well, one of the ways that you can um, mitigate the risk of contested logistics is to not require logistics in the first place. So how do you become exceptionally efficient in the force so that you can back out logistics and potentially back out risk? Um, well, you can, you can think about your, your platforms. I, mean, I think, Christine, you mentioned earlier um, our fuel use. Operational energy is 70% of the department's um, um, energy demand, and so 70% uh, of, uh, of our associated emissions. Um, of that, in fact, airplanes are actually about two-thirds or 70% of the, of the 70%. So what do we do to mitigate logistics risk on fuel in particular? But also, we talked last night a little bit about food and water. But on fuel in particular, how do you make your, your existing platforms more efficient? What kind of technologies can you deploy against your existing assets? And then what can you think about for future capability that considers uh, not just the uh, radar systems and weapons capabilities that you put on a system, but the, but the demand that those future systems might place on logistics if you think you have a significant risk in the logistics system. So what are your current system improvements that you can make, but also what are the future uh, systems that you might buy that might be more efficient or require, uh, require less fuel or a different kind of fuel? Now, those are all decisions that we need to consider and make in the context of the joint warfighting concept. They also happen to be quite good for the climate. Um, that said, the lack of consensus around this and the lack of understanding that those align that, that alignment is really exists uh, impedes us from, one, um, building a force that's as capable as it can be. And in fact, it impedes the United States from being as competitive as we should be on the global, in, the, in the global economy as we, as we face uh, an energy transition. We can, we can get into the scale and scope of that transition and what it means for the Department of Defense and particular platforms and systems. Um, but, and for what it means for U.S. competitiveness. But I think the, the gap, again, to go back to the gaps, is, is this gap in understanding and consensus that I think keeps us from, from being as competitive and as, and as strong a, a military as we can be. Thank you. So that's great. I'm going to uh, take the uh, moderator prerogative of asking the, the first kind of question. And, um, and I'm going to cheat, Andrew, because I know we're the gaps panel. But in my experience, people that have thought a lot about gaps, as all of you have, often have thought about what would I do to solve the gap. And so I'm going to do kind of a real fast lightning round. The theme I've heard from all of you is we need to bring people, communities, um, policymakers, whoever, together um, in order to solve these problems, which is going to require us to raise awareness and prioritization. That some piece of that seemed to come out in each of your remarks, and so I'm going to reverse and ask, how would you raise that awareness? What would, how could you bring people together, whether it's the patchwork quilt in the Asia Pacific or the communities or whatever? So I'm going to go, go through and ask, and I'm going to start with you, Joe. How would you, you said that there's a lack of consensus. What would you do about that? So uh, one of the things that we recognize and that I recognize in, the, in, the, in my current position is, uh, you know, I think we've all experienced this, the, the person is the message sometimes. And um, one of the challenges you have is I'm here talking about climate change in the Department of Defense, but my title actually is the climate advisor to the secretary and the chief sustainability officer. So what do you expect? Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the things that we need to do is give all of our, um, all of our leaders, our combatant commanders, and our military leaders and our civilian leaders who maybe don't do climate as a job to help them understand why this matters to them and their missions and have them be the validator for the proposition that we need to change the way we do business. Um, and doing that requires us to support an analytical framework and some products that help them see that. So we need to look at, in our, we, and we've invested heavily in things like war gaming and analytics and, uh, and analysis that takes an objective view as to what are the implications of this problem for the Department of Defense, what are the benefits that we could accrue from efficiency or, or uh, in our logistics system for making changes in our kinds of platforms. We, need to, we have to provide an analytical framework for folks who are maybe not climate advocates, but are advocates for what they want to do and find common ground to say, like, I don't care why you want to get to this place. I might want to get there because it's good for the climate. You might want to get there for it's good for the mission, but we all want to get there. And we have to peop provide people kind of an analytical base to get there. So we, we've, we've actually done a lot of investment. Uh, the department's made a lot of investment over the past couple of years in trying to build that framework and help people understand why this ought to matter to them. Great. So, so Rob, you talk about your recruiting effort and completely understand that this might be an opportunity for you. But it seems to me that people don't, you know, DARPA, high tech, cool. 
but maybe climate tech, not so high tech, not so cool. How do you change that perception? Yeah, I think that's that's the core challenge, and and I think some of this comes from you know a, a, a discomfort about DoD's role in climate technology in the climate communities, and and I think as the, the theme has come out strongly here, the the you know the the DoD interests and the climate interests overlap so strongly that that I think that's sort of an, an artificial barrier that that I think we need to communicate clearly to the community that you can come do climate motivated work. And the DOD will fully support that, not because of some nefarious reason how we're going to co-op that into something else, but because it's core to DOD's success and the national security of the country. Um, so I think that's the most important thing, is, is sort of bridging into new communities. And, and that's you know, one of the things that DARPA does extremely well. It's one of the, the powers of, of coming to DARPA is that we, we sort of have carte blanche to get outside of the, the current paradigms, the current organizational structures, the current communities and sort of put together new communities focused on those areas that we want to focus. And so my hope is that if we can attract the right people, we can help break down some of these walls to get more talent. I think it, it's sort of like the dam that'll, that'll open and, and then allow the communities to really merge together in a synergistic way. Okay. Eric, in many ways, I think you, you have such a hard problem with all of the underserved communities, the insurance challenges you talked about. Um, so, kind of two questions. For, is there anything that you can see we can do to bring communities together, raising awareness of this need? And, and then from an interagency perspective, because this is a very national security panel, is there a way the interagency, say DOD, but other agencies can work together with FEMA more effectively to help with these home national security problems? Yeah, I'd say briefly, um, you know, FEMA, we're emergency managers, and one of our our goals and our strategic plan is to increase the climate literacy of our workforce um, through training and what have you. So we, um, I'll give you an example. Uh, a common topic is a, a managed retreat or community-driven relocation from climate change, either coastal or inland. We, we, we fund uh, through our grant programs helping communities partially or fully relocate. So we need climate literate uh, 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 employees that can help communities guide them through that, uh, that particular process. With the interagency, um, the good news is that uh, we certainly know where to go. The science-based agencies, uh, USGS, uh, NOAA, um, NASA, uh, we work very closely with them and pull a lot of their uh, models and expertise and bring them to uh, uh, the emergency management community to help communities understand what is available. In terms of working with the interagency, I can tell you um, there's a, a lot more coordination that goes on than uh, uh, you're probably aware of. I sit on uh, a number of White House-driven interagency working groups. There's one on wildfire. There's one on community-driven community relocation. Uh, there's one on, on flooding. Um, uh, so there's a number. There's a number. There's a big wildfire commission that, that's out there as well. So. Uh, the White House through the Climate Office is really showing uh, leadership and bringing all of us together to address those, you know, who has what capability, how can we work together, how can we make our programs more manageable and digestible at the state and local level for communities that are trying to uh, mitigate the effects of, of climate change. So I'd say the White House has done an exceptional job of bringing all of us together and our resources, and they're quite active um, in that space. Thank you. On the Arctic, John, you, you threw in for me policy gaps, and I appreciate it. So it seems like policy is often you know, trailing behind the crisis is here, and we're now just thinking about the policy. And you talked about the lack of prioritization for the Arctic. What would you do to flip that paradigm? Yeah, uh, well, I think that uh, if, you, if you look at the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which was a tremendous effort to bring together 10 years of negotiation to bring together and uh, you know, you, as, uh, as some of the folks that were involved in that negotiation, you got to adopt it in whole, right? There's a lot of balancing that took place in terms of how far territorial seas should extend, how far the exclusive economic zone should extend, what are the rules that have, you know, that come to bear in each one of those areas. But I think what we're finding also, Christy, so there's policy in there. Whether people follow the policy or not, you know, that's a different matter. Uh, I think, though, that we're seeing, and the Arctic might be you know, another case study, is that, uh, hey, the high seas are also in need of some kind of yeah. uh, policy, some kind of governance, because you can get out there now and you know, just decimate 
an entire nation's food supply by illegal fishing. You can do that in, the, in many nations. You can do that in their EEZ, and they don't even know. Right, because they don't have the maritime domain awareness to uh, detect it, never mind respond to it, right? And so it kind of gets to be a might makes right, you know, who can send the most ships to a particular area. And, and the high seas are not immune to that now. So I think that uh, the Arctic, we, we can govern, at least, you know, there are rules in place for, for uh, territorial seas, EEZs. I think that uh, those parts of uh, the Arctic Ocean and such that might be considered high seas. It's a nice place to start to think about governing, you know, what you, what uh, used to be sort of ungoverned seas, ungoverned right? Space. Yeah. I'd also like to say just to the to the uh, coolness factor of technology. I just if you haven't read the book uh, Cradle to Cradle by Bill McDonough and Michael Bromgar. Bill McDonough is an architect from University of Virginia. Michael Bromgar is a uh, Greenpeace chemist. And there, I think more than anything else, the attitude of that book is very instructive in that it's like, hey, look, you know, let's not denigrate or, or despise or hold accountable uh, you know, the history, right? We, we are where we are. And, and where we are is that we're a lot smarter than we used to be. And in terms of going forward, uh, if you take a design-based approach, you can do some very, very cool technological things to address climate change. And so, you know, with respect to just exciting your imagination, you know, the, these folks have participated in designs that use uh, the same approach that a termite mound might use to ventilate and heat and cool a, a massive building, right? And so the HVAC system almost isn't necessary because it used thermal drive and all of those sorts of things. And so these sorts of design-based approaches, I think, are as exciting technologically as almost anything you can do. And that combined with this attitude that Joe highlighted, like, hey, we can do both of these, right? We're the, we can walk and chew gum. We can become stronger and more mindful of the environment. I think uh, it's a great read. There's two books. There's the Cradle to Cradle and then the Upcycle, which means, hey, let's not recycle. Let's actually get better over time. And uh, the combination of just the mindset and the and the science behind that are, are two great reads. Anyway, thanks. That's great, thank you. So Sam, you talked about the Asia Pacific area of responsibility that is incredibly complicated. And most of readers referred again this morning also to NATO and then you know all of our partnerships in the Asia Pacific. You talked about it as a patchwork quilt. How do we bring people together in this critically important <laughs> AOR in order to address climate? Well, my observation and, and hearing from many of our partners and allies is that one thing they value about the U.S. policy and perspective in, in that part of the world is they generally view us as a benevolent power. So we're not trying to take their fish. We're not trying to take their land. We're trying to have all boats rise, and we benefit by that. So I think uh, at, the, at the policy level, ensuring that we maintain a benevolent tone with the people in that, most of the people in that world. Um, the second thing I think that they value all over the world is the, what they believe to be exquisite intelligence in ISR. And it's compared to what they have, it probably is exquisite. Now, and when I was PACOM, the NSA commander just complained all the time about how you're not, I'm never satisfied. I always need more, and that's true. You never can get enough intelligence. But I think when it comes to climate change that we need to have a... And a, a refresh look at how the intelligence community assesses what's happening and how they model it so that in parts of the world where you've got six out of 10 people living in very fragile uh, food sources and water sources and, and governments and all the stuff that I've talked about is that where they can be predictive of where the knee and the curve is gonna happen where it starts to fall apart. If that's the case, we can predict that. And I think in climate change, it's, it's all happening. I mean, we might slow it down, but it's moving, right? And it's predictable when you won't be able to grow rice in Vietnam anymore, right? Mm -hmm. And when, you won't, when the water supply is gonna get turned off to Singapore, which they're already mitigating that, right? Because they know this is coming. That you can get, we, as a group of nations there, you could get in front of this and you could put in place mitigations. The US could put resources to help mitigate like they did in Bangladesh where now Instead of a, a 400,000 people dying in a hurricane or in a t typhoon, now 4,000 die. So that's primarily because of what the U.S. did to help them mitigate 
and to help them plan for evasion of when a hurricane and sheltering and, and restoring their lives to normal. So I really think that, that, that ISR, the intelligence piece of it, looking at it of all aspects of what is happening on the globe is critical and sharing it freely with them. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Another call for the intelligence. All right, I uh, would like now to open it up to our audience for some questions. We have, I think, uh, almost, not quite 10 minutes for questions. Is that right? You, we have the mics in the center, and then we also have some, some mics coming around, so however we want to do it. Great. Yes, sir, please. So uh, good morning. John Conger uh, with the Center for Climate and Security, uh, former deputy comptroller at DOD, so I'll put that aside. One of the, when we talk about gaps, uh, one of the things that stands out to me is nobody's talked about resource gaps and funding gaps. Uh, yet, which is very impressive that you had a whole panel on this and haven't, haven't talked about that yet. <laughs> so um, Admiral Stravitas this morning talked about imagination an awful lot. Uh, we often hear that uh, when you have strategy without budget, it's hallucination. Maybe we call it imagination now. Um, in that context, what stands out as a budget gap here? I know Joe's got a lot of money he fought for on Capitol Hill, uh, waiting to be approved by the, the House and Senate. Um, and we'll see what gets through, but what is the most important thing for additional funding that you guys see in, in this context? What, what is the gap that needs to be filled in that context? Who wants to jump on that? Please. Well, John, I, uh, good to see you again. I, I kind of hinted at this a little bit. Uh, I talked about aging infrastructure. Um, our pre-disaster mitigation grant program, BRIC, we had 2.3 billion this year. We were two times lower subscribed, and even 4.6 billion across the entire nation for all the hazards is really a drop in the bucket is what's needed to, to mitigate. Uh, you look at all the uh, uh, pre-flood insurance rate uh, homes and infrastructure, it's a, it's a drop in the bucket. So we try to spend the dollars we have wisely. I've got to be careful. I can't ask Congress for money. I just point out that the programs we do have are highly oversubscribed, and certainly we need a lot more funding to, to mitigate uh, uh, the infrastructure against climate change. There's no doubt about that. Great. Joe, do you want to jump in? Uh, sure. So um, one, I'll start by saying I think the department's actually done a pretty good job, and, and John, I think you can probably validate this, um, and you have to because I'm on stage and you'll make me look bad if you don't, <laughs> that we've done a pretty good job of resourcing what we said we needed to do. Uh, that said, it's, not, it's, it's never enough, right? We have uh, what we all understand to be, if you look at our facilities, we have $125 billion, $130, $135 billion maintenance backlog on our installations. We've put $670 million in the Energy Resilience and Conservation Improvement Program to address some of the kind of uh, resourcing gaps that we have around making our facilities more energy efficient and more resilient to the, to the challenge associated with climate change. But we'll never appropriate our way out of that. Uh, out, of the, out of the deficit that we're in. And I think we need to acknowledge that and figure out ways to work with the private sector, as was talked about in the last panel, to leverage uh, those resources to our, to, against our problem. Then I think there's some really exciting things, John. Um, operation, so I, again, I mentioned 70% of our, our fuel burn is in, is in operations. And future capabilities for uh, mitigating uh, the use of fuel in our operational platforms, uh, really interesting work that, uh, that we could do. Um, one of the platforms we're investing in is, uh, is Blended Wing Body uh, that we, uh, there's a solicitation on the street from DIU on, a uh, whole new kind of airframe that, that could change the way in which uh, um, um, the airline industry and the department, uh, tankers in particular, run with major uh, gains in efficiency. So I think we need to look for those ideas that are going to actually change the game because the incremental improvements aren't going to be able to get us to the, to, the, uh, to the objective that we all know faces us on climate. Thank you. And on capability. Thanks. Can I just add something? Yeah, sure. I think that Joe's hit on something really important, which is that uh, with respect to funding and pulling some of these technologies forward, uh, you mentioned there's a couple of public-private opportunities, right? This is not a, a DOD-only problem. And there's tremendous energy in the private sector, including major industry. And the SEC is starting to hold companies accountable to their climate goals, right? This greenwashing and all of that is... It's coming to an end, right? So they're going to want to see where the money is. And so, you know, how do we more creatively partner with private industry to advance those technologies, uh, to get them through that knothole as fast as possible? The customers on the private side are ready on the other side of that 
there's, I think, a unique role in government to, uh, certainly with regulation, right? If you're talking about energy regulation, how do we get those technologies approved? I think, uh, to uh, Rob's point, there's a uh, tremendous role for the government in the human infrastructure, and how do we get, uh, the, you know, you're here recruiting, which means they're gonna come from somewhere and go to you. Current premises accepted, I know, Ralph, right? So, uh, but anyway, we need to, we, we simply need more. There's a, there's, a there's a tremendous need for these types of skills, and so the, I think the government can do that. They can serve as the first customer to, to mature some of these technologies. And so uh, anyway, I think that a closer partnership, a more creative partnership with private industry would be helpful. helpful. Great, thank you. Yeah. yeah one uh, quick addition. We could also take a fresh look at how we spend our foreign assistance money mm -hmm. and where it goes, you know, and maybe realign it towards climate change issues that provide their security, which in turn supports our security, rather than some of the other ways we spend it, which maybe haven't proved as productive for our security in the long run. Because there's an interesting way that money is allocated and spent, um, and it's certainly not towards mitigating the effects of climate change. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks very much. Okay, so we are really going to run out of time. I'm not going to get to everybody in line. I'm really sorry. But I am going to take Sherry's uh, approach from the last panel and bundle the next couple of questions. So could you just quickly state your question, and we'll see what we can do. Of course. So um, I'm Jacqueline Putnam. I'm currently the acting technical director at the U.S. National Ice Center. Um, my question is largely directed at Admiral Richardson. Um, so, so you mentioned the, the gaps of knowledge when it comes to operating in the Arctic. So I was just curious to know what is currently being done by the DOD to address those gaps in knowledge? Maybe better prepare aerographers' mates to forecast in the Arctic, OODs to actually navigate inside of ice-infested waters, and how do small entities like the National Ice Center, Fleet Weather Center, SINMOC as a whole prepare itself to respond to that signal? Okay, and I'm gonna take the next question and then I'm so sorry I'm gonna to have to cut you off, but people are gonna be around for lunch. Yeah. Um, so my name is Marisol Maddox. I'm with the Polar Institute at the Wilson Center, right here. Oh, there you are. <laughs> um, so just, I wanted to quickly clarify that actually a couple years ago there was a treaty signed for the Central Arctic Ocean um, to prevent unregulated fisheries right. from occurring. Um, and it was specifically meant to be kind of using precautionary principle and preventing a tragedy, the common situation. And this treaty does engage all of the major fishing countries, United States, China, Russia, the European Union, Korea, et cetera. Um, and they even successfully had the first convening of parties uh, last November, kind of amidst all of the um, you know, uncertainty with the war. So I think that is a positive step. For sure. Um, but, you know, it is interesting that because the U.S. is not party to the U.N. Convention on Law of the Sea, but we're planning to submit our extended continental shelf claim, that has never happened before from a non-signatory, so it'll be kind of interesting to see yep. if that is able to, to go forward. Yeah. Um, and then I just had a quick question about essentially tying in universities to help to better prepare the workforce that you need in real time. Uh, I had recently finished a, an international security graduate program and my last semester, Erin Sikorsky, who's one of our future speakers, um, she taught the first climate security class and I was so glad to see that because that's what I had kind of brought my graduate work to, to focus on. Um, but I just see that there, there seems to be a real lag of incorporating like whatever people are studying, there needs to be that climate dimension to understand how is your career field going to be impacted. And so even for um, Mr. Levin, um, with FEMA and having people in place who can help communities with relocation questions. Like, are you communicating with universities to kind of help to make sure that we have the workforce with the skills that we need for the new reality in which we're operating? Okay, so we're gonna tackle Arctic education and sir, please, quickly your question. Yeah, Alex Philp with the MITRE Corporation. Um, each of you and even the previous panel discussed the importance of information, how that leads to understanding. There's been some discussions about gaps. Um, my question for you to tackle later is uh, how important, the significance right now that scientific understanding is under attack, 
Uh, in other words, scientists get up and they're attacked for their beliefs and understanding and it's questioned. Second of all, there's very intentional data poisoning and very intentional control of the very earth information we'll need in order to make better decisions. So it's, it's what can we do to address um, actually a widening gap in our belief and understanding in, in, in science and how science will lead us, and two, active measures that are occurring to undermine the very data structures necessary to understand our optionality. Thank you. Okay, so let's start with the last question. Who wants to address data poisoning and data challenges? Yeah, I'll just say that it, it's, you know, um, across climate and a broad range of topics, yeah. it's, a, it's a real threat to national security. It's one that DARPA, that is an area where we're very well, um, you know, significantly investing in trying to understand, mitigate, provide new tools to, to understand it um, and, and, and to, to, you know, influence, understand when influence campaigns are being attempted and try to mitigate those things. Um, so so I, I sort of, I, I think it's, a, I can validate that that is a real threat in climate and more broadly and there is a significant amount of activity underway to mitigate it. Good, Eric, do you wanna hit on the education piece? Yeah, I, I, uh, we, we have centers of excellence at the Department of Homeland Security. I actually uh, uh, gave you a fairly large uh, task order to uh, the Coastal Center of Excellence, which is at North Carolina State. They are doing exactly that. They're reaching out to universities around the country, um, trying to find professors who have availability and are showing an interest, uh, have grad students who wanna help communities understand climate data help them understand uh, planning and mitigating uh, against any vulnerabilities, whether it be uh, um, climate or, or earthquake or what have you. So we actually have a, they're doing that right now, trying to collect all of the, those universities that are providing data and help and those that would like to, uh, making them available to us so that we can better connect communities with academia. I think academia plays a very large role in this. Yeah, as well, I think when I was the chief of the Navy, we um, stood up an effort called Task Force Ocean, which I think directly addressed what you're after, which was like, hey, we're just gonna fund a lot of research in the, in the universities uh, to get after what I saw was sort of a lagging, uh, uh, a, a general lag in ocean sciences, ocean acoustics, and those sorts of things. And so, you know, I think that when you talk about the government's role in the human infrastructure problem, which is kind of a, you know, how uh, I, I address that anyway, there's just, you know, the direct funding of research and uh, scholarships in those areas can make a big dent. Great. Yeah. Yeah. And Sam, thanks for the update on the treaty. <laughs> <laughs> that is good news. Sam, let me ask you for closing comments. Anything? Well, I don't know if sure I quite understood the question about data poisoning, but I think he meant undermining the scientific community because of different factions. Um, I would just say that the, the truth will be in the climate, right? I mean, the climate, yeah. it's, the truth is there. So if you, you know, it, it's happening and, and the world needs to see it's happening and they rely on primarily these types of institutions in the United States to be able to divulge it to them in a way that makes them understand why it's happening to them and what they can do about it. Gentlemen. So don't stop. Going to give you the last word. Yeah, give me the last word. Uh, I would only say that uh, clear and consistent messaging from uh, from the Department of Defense and our leaders and folks like those on the stage is really important because um, we need to make sure people understand that if you, in fact, dismiss the science or or don't take some of these changes into account, that you're not just risking um, our own uh, your own. Uh, mental health, you're risking national security because these are factors that, that impact what we do both in the United States and what we need to do and what we might be asked to do in the future. And, and you don't want to ignore, we do, we, do, we do planning really well and I think ignoring one of the major, a major planning factor would be a real mistake if you wanted to, wanted operations and I think, uh, I think that's a really important uh, thing for us to communicate. Thank you. I would really like to thank our panelists for their really great comments about gaps and some proposed solutions as well. So please join me in thanking them and thank all of you also.